Well, hey, good morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Okay, great. It's okay. The other, the other hour didn't wish me a happy Thanksgiving either. I didn't take it too personally. Um, we'll work on that for Christmas. We'll get into a rhythm. Uh, for those of you that are celebrating maybe an early Christmas with some family that you just are seeing for Thanksgiving, happy Thanksmas coming up. It's a very intermediate holiday. It's fun to think about what you're going to get for Christmas, right? You try to predict maybe what you're going to get. Uh, we like to make predictions. Uh, at one point, uh, I was interested in predictions. I was interested to see, I think I got angry at the uh, meteorologist for being wrong about something. And I want to know, like, how is somebody that seems wrong so much, and I was very upset, irrationally so, how do they keep getting to do their job? Which is unfair, but I went ahead and looked up, I looked up who's wronger, wronger, more wrong, than meteorologists, and I found out there's a lot of professions that actually are, uh, have a greater margin of error in their predicting. And the one that is the greatest, and I apologize if this offends anybody, but I got it off the internet, which is never wrong. <laughs> it's economists. Economists are more often wrong in their predictions than any other field. That doesn't mean that they're wrong all the time. It just means they have a higher percentage of error. Now, I don't know enough about economy stuff to tell you how, but that's just what I read again on the internet. Now, which is never wrong. Now, what, what, what is important about this, the role that economists play is to predict what the, the, the economy is going to do, what, what, what's going to happen with our finances, because we find a lot of security, a lot of value in making sure that we know what our money is going to do. There is comfort and security that comes when I open up my bank statement or I open up the computer and I see how much money I have and I'm like, oh, I've got money in there. That's great. Guess what, Hattie and Sophie? You get to eat this month. On the other hand, there's a great deal of despair fear and trepidation that comes when you open up that same statement and there's not anything in there. We derive a lot of our safety, our security, our definition of success revolves around the dollar bill, around money. We evaluate presidencies by their success and failure, often by what the economy does. We evaluate a lot based on money. And it's unpredictable. We have a wrong belief about money. It's so unpredictable that it's so hard for us to put so much value and security in something that is so unreliable. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to look at Proverbs for the last time this week, or, or for this series, and I want us to look and see the three paradoxes that you can see in the book of Proverbs and change what we believe about money so that God can begin to work in our lives and set us free from this... Uh, uh, security blanket that we think we need and that we think we have, uh, that is money. The first uh, passage we'll be in is in Proverbs 10, 2 through 4. And the first paradox I want you to see is that gold is not gold. Gold is not gold. Despite its ancient nature, coin collecting still remains incredibly popular as a hobby. Depending on where you look, uh, there's about 500,000 coin collectors in the United States alone. Some notable people are coin collectors. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, coin collector. Jack Black, the school of rock man himself, coin collector. Nicole Kidman, also coin collector. Interesting. Historically speaking, FDR, Thomas Jefferson were coin collectors. And coin collectors are really the only people who love money for money's sake. They're the only ones that look at a, at, a, at a unit of currency and they're like, oh, look at that one. Look how it's designed. Look how it's shaped. They love money for the intrinsic value of it. Just, just the beauty of the piece, the rarity of it. The rest of us love money for something completely different. I love money because of what it can get me, what it can satisfy in me, what it can acquire for me. I don't love money for money's sake. If all of a sudden toenail clippings became the currency, I would love toenail clippings. Yeah. Money's just about as gross, let's be honest. They've done studies. We love money, what it can get us. I can't tell the difference between a 1943 Lincoln Head copper penning that is worth $2 million and a 2003 penny that somebody found on a street. Couldn't tell you the difference. 
But there's a vast difference in value. It's because I don't love money for money's sake. I love what it can get me. And this shows us something that we already know, instinctively know about money, and is that the gold that we want to get isn't actually the gold. It's not the prize. The money isn't the profit. The money isn't the really significant thing. It's what it can get for us. And so we have to ask ourselves then, what is real profit? What is real profit? Look at verses 2 through 4 in chapter 10. It says, Treasures gained by wickedness do not gain profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. So what are we working for? What is the profit here? What are we gaining? Well, the first thing you want from money is to be satisfied. You want your needs to be satisfied. In our world, the, way, the most common way to satisfy your ongoing repetitive needs are to buy something. Our needs are unfortunately ongoing and repetitive. I had breakfast this morning. It was delicious. And guess what? Let's just be honest. I'm hungry now. Some of you are too. You're like, come on, Travis, you get done sooner. Like, you're in control here at this point. Like, we could all go get lunch if you would just hush. Our needs are ongoing and repetitive, and the way we meet those needs is to buy something. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Money's kind of this neutral thing, right? But what happens is, and you see it in verse 2, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. That is a cool, poetic way of saying security. We try to find our security, our safety in money. And we said it earlier, the more money I have, the better I feel. The less I have, the more uncomfortable I feel. And what the the, the proverb writer is telling us is that it's righteousness that delivers from death, which in Proverbs, righteousness is defined by living wisely. And when I've talked with you, I've said wisdom is is navigating the gray areas of life in such a way that honors God, loves other people, and makes the most out of your life. That's what wisdom is. Biblical wisdom, anyway. And so the writer is saying that wisdom leads to righteousness, and righteousness is security. That's what safety and security is. But money is so, man, it's so tempting. Because you can assign a number, a quantitative value to how safe and secure you are. I am X number of dollars above being destitute. That's nice. That's a comforting thing. But it is a righteous person who trusts in the Lord. We're called to trust in the Lord. We're called to not put our faith in a number, but to put our faith in God. If I were to tell you every single time that I I talked with you, how many people we have coming into our services, and every time I defined our success as a church based on how many people were sitting here, I think some of you, many of you, hopefully, would be very irritated by that. Because you say, "How how could you put a success of a church based on how many people are there? Why do we do that with our bank accounts? Why do we define our success by what we make? We are called to trust the Lord. But look what happens in verse 3. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. It's incredibly interesting that in one hand, the Proverbs writer is telling us, God's going to meet your needs. And in the next verse, he's like, but you better work. Okay. There's a tension there, right? If you let go and let God, if all of us were to just quit our jobs and go sit out on the street and not say anything to anybody, you can't do any work and just expect to be fed, I imagine many of us would be very, very hungry. Because the truth of the matter is, God has designed a system of providence for us whereby his people are provided by work. Work is not simple. Work is not bad. When Adam and Eve are created, they're placed in the garden And he places them there to do work. What? To do work. He says to work the garden and tend it. 
That's before mankind ever falls. So work is this God-given thing where God invites us to come alongside him and he says, hey, I want to take care of my creation because I love it and I want you to come with me. Come on. I've made you in such a way that you can do a very specific thing that's going to contribute to the overall blessing of creation. Because of sin, creation seems to want to spin the drain and like fall into chaos. And we are a part of God's plan to keep chaos from reclaiming the creation. That's the real profit. That's the real satisfaction of being, uh, of working, of existing. It's not a dollar sign. It's not a paycheck. If you make thousands upon thousands upon thousands and millions of dollars, but you derive no satisfaction of your work, that is a terrible place to be. And the person who makes less but derives more satisfaction is way more blessed. And some of you may struggle. You may look at your job and you may be like, I don't see how in the world what I do is a way that God cares for creation. Please come talk to me. I would love to sit down and be like, all right, let's talk about what you do. I will do my best to understand it. Because let's be honest, some of y'all do stuff that I'm like, it's basically rocket science. But we'll, we'll work on it. You'll teach me, and then we can talk through how it is that God uses that. Because your work is really important. That satisfaction that you derive, that's gold. That satisfaction that you find in God by working with him, that's the gold. But if it's true, if profit is more than a paycheck, then success has to be more than a paycheck as well. Look at 818. It's just probably one page over in your Bible. 818. It says, riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. So in the, uh, in the Proverbs, we talked about this, I think, week one. Uh, the, the Proverbs are sometimes presented as a, a, a faithful woman speaking, like a righteous woman speaking. And so she's saying, if you come to me, if you come to wisdom, you'll have enduring righteousness. And in the second verse... She starts talking about yield and fruit, which are agricultural terms, okay? That's important. We'll come back to that in a second. How do we define, though, success? How is success defined? We look at success, and we talked about this a little bit with conflict. Success is an event, right? You finish the job, you close the case, you close the deal, you finish the project, and success, yay! But what if that's not success? Why is it that so many people that we determine as successful, like your Bezoses, your, your Bill Gates, your other people, why are they so successful in some ways, but so miserably not in others? Like, why did both of their marriages fail? Why is it that one in four entrepreneurs fail before they succeed? Why is it that Winston Churchill defines success as going from one failure to another without loss of enthusiasm. That man could turn a phrase. Here's the problem. We think of success, much like conflict, as an event. Success is not an event. It is a condition. You see, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates were successful essentially one time. Now, granted, it was huge. But they have essentially ridden the wave of that success the rest of their lives. And that doesn't mean they haven't been successful in other things, but largely what they have done since is they have gathered around them other people and have reaped the benefits of their successes. That's nothing wrong with that. I'm just, that's how it's worked, right? They hit one big home run and then you invest, right? I mean, investment is essentially buying into other people's success or buying into other people's failure. That's what investment is. You're buying a share of success or failure. Being successful one time if you're a farm, if you're an agricultural person, if you're a farmer, one successful crop is not the definition of a successful farmer. A successful far far farmer has a bumper crop year after year after year after year after year. That's a successful farm. We've got to change our mentality that success is not one thing. It's not one metric. It's not one, uh, one event. It is a condition. You live a successful life, not a successful series of events. And if you want your life to be successful, if you want to be fruitful, you must pursue wisdom. And this is pursuing the Lord. 
This is pursuing him. You've got to put your money in its proper place. Mark 8, 36, some of you probably have this memorized. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And we know that and we agree with it. And we go right back out of here Monday morning and we start exchanging bits of our soul for a paycheck. We've got to change our thinking. Gold is not gold. It's not bad, but it's not gold. So how do we do this? Well, that leads us to our second paradox. Giving is gaining. Giving is gaining. I was going to spend a lot of time talking about this, uh, but I really don't have to. Most world religions agree uh, that the reason why our world has any sort of kindness or selflessness in it is because of the collective teachings of generosity and selflessness that the dominant world religions teach. So pretty much every world religion has some sort of communal do unto others kind of idea that keeps us from falling into just, you know, the hunger games or whatever. And so uh, it, it's really interesting that that is sort of what people put at the feet of religion is this concept of, of generosity and care uh, and things like that. They all agree on it. And it's one of the reasons why if you look around our city, right, you have hospitals that are named after denominations, right? You have Presbyterian, you have Methodist hospitals, you have Baylor, which is Texan for Baptist. You got all these things. And, and so it's, it's clear like where this sort of idea has originated from. But the Bible, often like the Bible does, will take something that's a common teaching that everybody can kind of get around, and then it'll like elevate it. Jesus does this on the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody's like, yeah, don't kill people. That's not unique to the Ten Commandments, y'all. Everybody's pretty much like, yeah, that's a bad idea. But Jesus then takes it and elevates it, and the Proverbs do the same thing. They give you three different ways that generosity, biblical generosity, is a, is a leap over normal generosity. And the first one is this in verse 24 of chapter 11. It says, biblical generosity is giving freely. One gives freely, this is verse 24, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. What the proverb is telling you here is this kind of paradoxical nature. You would think that the more money I give, the less I'm going to have. But the proverb is saying, no, 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 no. You will gain so much more. You will be a richer person the more generous you are and the more freely you give. And again, we're back to an agricultural metaphor. If you're a farmer, you scatter seed, you don't hoard the seeds. You don't skimp when you're sowing. The more seed I have out there, guess what's going to happen? The more crop I will have later. We use the same principle in investment, right? The more money you put into something, when it hits big, the more money you will have back, right? if it's successful. It's the same with a crop. And this is a spiritual truth. God is saying that the more you give away, and the more you don't think about it, the more that's just your reaction, the more successful, the more blessed, the more, more, and I'm not talking about just financial blessing. That's not what I mean. I'm saying the more satisfied you will be in life. And what we do is we often reject the idea of giving freely. We like to give, but not giving freely. Because a lot of us like to think, we like to know where our money goes, because many of us, that's how we found our success, right? You've got a budget and all that stuff, or you're good with money. You're one of the economists that's like, Travis, I'm not like you right now. And that's okay. The, the thing is, the Bible teaches you to scatter money like seed. Give freely. Oftentimes when I'm driving, you know, you'll see somebody panhandling on the side of the road, and I know it's illegal, but whatever. And I often will say like, ah, oh, well, I don't know what they're going to do with that, so I'm not going to give. And I, I, people have told me that that's probably a good approach and like things like that. But let's be honest. If I'm really frank with you, I use that as a permission slip to not be generous ever in those situations. And I think many of us do the same, where we're like, mm, I don't know what they're going to do with that, so I'm not going to give them anything. God doesn't call us to be responsible for what people do with our gifts. Now, that doesn't mean you just give people whatever, whenever, and even though you can clearly tell like, what they're going to do with it. That's not what I'm saying. But don't let wisdom be a crutch for not giving gener generously. That's not biblical wisdom. Biblical generosity is also an act of faith. Look at verse 28. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. 
One of the great pitfalls of money is so often that because it's a means to an end, we can find our security in it, right? We, we, we think, if I got enough money, I'll be okay. If I don't, uh, I'll fall into depression, anxiety, and worry, and fear. But what the Proverbs here is saying, it's saying that faith can be evidenced by generosity. And I say can be because you can be generous without being full of faith. You give sacrificially. You give until it hurts. And many of us, and I don't want to demean this at all, but many of us give out of our excess. We have a little extra, so we give. And I think that's fine initially, but God calls us to a sacrificial kind of giving, and here's why. There's two reasons for it. One, we talked about this earlier, you're made in the image of God. And so our whole purpose of existence, are you ready for this? Your purpose is to show the world what God is like. So whatever you do is you're telling the world, this is who I think God is, okay? That's how you're designed. So when we give generously, we are telling the world that we believe in a generous God, and he is a generous God. God gives freely, even though the fact, going back to the last thing we talked about, we mess up the stuff God gives us all the time. We use it for terrible things all the time. And God still freely gives. He's incredibly gracious, incredibly abundant in his gifts. And so when we are gracious in giving in our gifts, we are showing who we think God is. God also gives sacrificially, which is really hard to do when you have an infinite amount of everything. Giving sacrificially is really difficult unless you only have one of something. And he gives his son, his only son. He gives so that it hurts to rescue us and restore us and redeem us from our own sin and our own brokenness when we put our faith and trust in him. And so when we give, what we're saying is when we give sacrificially, we're saying this is how God is. This is who I believe him to be. And not only that, I also believe that he is going to supply our needs. I believe that he will continue to be who he was over here. I'm believing that God never changes. Your giving, and again, because we're talking about money, I'm talking about money. Your giving says a lot about your faith. And I think that's wise that we were talking about money the last week of our study of Proverbs. Because frankly, we show a lot of our faith with what we do with our money. And I'm the same way. Like I am just as perhaps successful in some ways and guilty as some others, as you guys are. It's a common problem because our world system is really built around money. So when we give, we show who we believe God to be. Lastly, biblical generosity is a pathway to joy. Look at verse 8 of chapter 16. Verse 8 of chapter 16. It says, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with injustice. The Proverbs were written to kind of coach a people, not just one person, but a people on how to have a fair and just society. And what the writer of this proverb is saying is, he's saying, look, if you've got to pick a society that is economically prosperous, prosperous, but unjust, or you have to pick one that's not as economically prosperous, but just pick this one. This one's better. This one's better. It's better to have a little bit, but to have justice than to have a great deal of things and have injustice. This is not asceticism, by the way. This isn't give away everything and you'll be happy. And I think that's interesting. The Proverbs never tell us, the Bible never really tells us, give away everything and you'll find the happiness that you long for. As we'll see in just a minute, both can be pathways to destruction. What it's saying is, if you want freedom, if you want to find joy, if you want to find treasure... Put your money in the hands of the Lord, trust him with it, and give as he directs you to give. Talk to him about it. Pray about it. Ask him about it. Be like, God, what do you want me to do with this? Sometimes he'll tell you, just put it in the bank. Sometimes he'll say, take, it to a, take your family to a nice meal. Sometimes he'll say, whatever, I don't, might not say anything, okay. But sometimes he'll tell you to give. Trust him with your bank account. And I think that'll lead to a great deal of joy. But lastly, the last paradox that we see is that poverty and prosperity are equally dangerous. They're equally dangerous. This is the last stop on our tour of the Proverbs. We've not covered nearly all of them. 
uh, but we're in 30 verse uh, 7, 7 through 9. And these are the words of a man named Agur, son of Jacka. So if you're looking for some baby names, there you go. Agur, son of Jacka. Um, somebody in here is named Agur, and they're like, what the heck, man? Come on. But he's dying, and his last wishes are for people to hear his last words. This is his, it's called a last tattoo. Your last tattoo are your last words. And he wants these people to hear what he has to say. And this is what he says in verse 7. He says, two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. What he's doing here is he's connecting falsehood and lying with poverty and wealth. And you might be sitting there being like, yeah, wealth lies to you. No, poverty does too. Poverty and wealth distort reality. They change the way you see the world you live in. If you are wealthy, you will look at yourself and you will say, wow, how blessed we are. God must be really pleased with us. So grateful for what I got. But man, I worked really hard. And you'll start putting your trust in those things that you own. If you're impoverished, you'll look at yourself and you'll be like, "Now God must really be upset with me. We must have done something wrong, something to offend him, because we don't have anything, and my life is all about securing this future for my family or for me. You might think of yourself as a bad husband. You might think of yourself as a bad wife or a bad uh, uh, parent, because you haven't provided for your family, whereas the wealthy person considers themselves good at those things just because they've provided That is a distortion of reality. You have reduced your existence down to how many dollars you provide for the people around you and yourself, and that is not God's design for you. Both are pathways to destruction. Both can lead you to reject the God who created you, reject the narrative that he has for you, and reject your place in his creation. Both will do that. Both poverty and wealth can lead to absolutely ruinous things in your relationship with God. You see, here's the thing. God has made us to need him. You have all these needs. Nobody's denying that. You have ongoing needs, ongoing wants. And God has made us both to need and to find our satisfaction for those needs in him. And some of you might be sitting there and being like, well, Travis, that seems like a really selfish, kind of egotistical God to make people so that they need you. What kind of codependency is that? Well, one, it's not codependency because he doesn't need us. But two, whether you're rejecting that idea or not, it doesn't change the truth of it. Whether it bothers you or not doesn't change whether or not it's true. You have got to deal with the fact that you have a creator who has designed you to find your satisfaction in him. And as long as you do not do that, you will constantly chase often the things that money can get you. And if you want to know, if you want to put a price tag, a number, on how much satisfaction you find in the Lord, ask yourself, how much satisfaction do I find in my money? We all have needs. We all have desires. We all have wants. And God wants to meet and satisfy those needs, so much so that he took the greatest need that we have, the need for a savior, and he sent his son to die for us. He sent him for us so that we could find those. We weren't ever going to find satisfaction unless God made a way, and he did. I was driving back from Kansas uh, this week. I took my family up there, and, and I'm going back for Thanksgiving. And as I was driving back, I was listening to uh, the radio. And uh, the radio, by the way, young people, is this bandwidth thing, and it has radio waves. And uh, the Eagles, Hotel California came on, uh, which the Eagles, I know this is a hot take. I'm going to go ahead and say it. They're the Nickelback of the 70s. It just is true. Um, I, I love the wave of offense that everybody just took. It was greatness. I said that so that you'll listen to the next part. Hotel California came on, and there's this line in Hotel California where he's trying to escape from this place that I'm not sure what the song is about. It's probably drugs because that's what all the songs back then were about. But he's trying to escape, and he says, uh, he sees people eating 
And he says, they stab it with their steely knives, but they just can't kill the beast. That is what your cravings are. That is what my cravings are. I go and I buy something new and I'm like, oh, this is going to satisfy me. And two weeks later, I'm like, meh, it's okay. Stab it. Stab that craving. Oh, it's back alive again. I got to satisfy it with the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And this is why Christ came. He came so that we could stop trying to slay the beast on our own. He allowed himself to be pierced with steel-like nails, crucified for us so that we could find our satisfaction in him. That is the gift that's offered to you today. Stop putting a price tag on it. I promise you it's worth it. Not everything, uh, gold is not gold. Giving is gaining. And poverty and wealth both have their pathways to destruction, but Jesus is the only one who can tell you what you should be doing with your money. Listen to him, trust him, give him your life. My hope for you is that as we enter this time of response, that you'll take a moment to think about your money. Think about your bank statement. Think about the needs that you have. Think about the wants you have. And go to God and confess whatever idols you have, because they're there, tear them down. Ask the Lord how he wants to use your, your money. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you have blessed us. Lord, we all have in this room breath in our lungs, a heartbeat in our chest, and we're able to consider your ways. And so we are blessed. And throughout this room, there are varying degrees of wealth. Some of the wealthiest people in our city perhaps are in this room, and maybe even some of the poorest. And you love each one equally. Both of needs you, and everybody in between needs you as well. And so I pray that in your grace, through your spirit, you would awaken our hearts, not to the flesh desires of what our money can get us, but for you. Thank you for all that you do and all that you are. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.